let us take a moment to join our hearts and minds and pray together for God's illumination. Take a deep breath with me in and out. Oh God, we give you thanks for your holy word, for the celebration of sacraments and for the joy of knowing you in so many ways. We ask that you would illumine our minds and our hearts to your holy word this morning. Bless the words that we hear, write them upon our hearts, and help them to live them in our lives every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson comes from Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite selections of scripture, the whole chapter. This morning, we begin at verse 18. Indeed, I consider the sufferings of the present to be nothing compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. All creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the children of God. Creation was subjected to transience and futility, not of its own accord, but because of the one who subjected it in the hope that creation itself would be freed from its slavery to the corruption and would come to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that from the beginning until now, all of creation has been groaning in one great act of giving birth. And not only creation, but all of us who possess the first fruits of the Spirit, we too groan inwardly as we wait for our bodies to be set free. In hope, we were saved. But hope is not hope if its object is seen. Why does one hope for what one can already see? Hoping for what we cannot see means awaiting it with patient endurance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those last few words of that scripture, though, patient endurance, kind of make me want to grind my teeth a little bit sometimes. Patient endurance. Waiting is not an easy thing. There's at least one songwriter who agrees with me. Waiting is the hardest part. And endurance, if we shorten that word to endure, it's part waiting and part suffering, like treading water or waiting for the second hand of the clock to tick by. Waiting and enduring are exhausting. However, they're sometimes kind of a little bit important. So I like to think about the idea of patient endurance a little bit like peas. I have not always liked to eat peas. They are little small green things that can be mushy and if they're not cooked well they can taste a little bit funny. Now I being an adult I get to choose what I like to eat and I have the ability to avoid the foods that I don't like to eat. So for a good part of my adult life, when someone would make me a dish that included peas, I would just kind of push them off to the side of the plate and avoid them if I could. Except there was this one time when someone made me this very, very delicious pasta dish, and it just so happened to have peas in it. I pushed my peas off to the side of my plate at first, but finally there were so many peas in this dish that one of them must have like snuck in around a spaghetti noodle or something like that, and I ended up eating one. And let me tell you, they added so much to that pasta dish. I was so pleasantly surprised to have this bright and crisp and lovely flavor that was in a dish that I already loved. So the next time that someone served me a dish and it had peas in it, I tried it, and it was pretty good. 
I started adding them to all kinds of things. And sometimes I would add them and it really did the same thing it did that very first time that I had had them. It made it beautiful and fabulous. And there were other times when I didn't think that the peas were all of that great and they didn't totally alter the flavor of the dish. But I did remember that they're pretty nutritious and they're good to eat. And it was probably a good choice as an adult to make good, healthy eating habits and choices. Now, let me say, I do not go and get myself a bowl of peas with nothing else on them and sit and enjoy them. There may be people out there who do that, and blessings upon you. I like to sort of sprinkle them into things. So I think that patience, patient endurance, is a little bit like peas. We don't say to ourselves, okay, I'm going to need a whole bowl of peas, like it's ice cream, and eat it and feast on it, but add it to our life, sprinkled into our dishes and to our life and our practices. Patient endurance is pretty smart and pretty healthy and it can make all of the difference to take a dish from great to fabulous. Our scripture reminds us that all creation is eagerly waiting. We are waiting for revelations, for more of God's wisdom to be imparted to us through the Holy Spirit. We're waiting for Jesus. We are waiting for justice to be done in our communities and our countries and for our neighbors. We are hoping for healing for those that we love. We're hoping for a world that is ripe with opportunity and goodness, not just for ourselves, but for our children, for those who are younger than us and those who will come behind us. We have to make a choice to do that. We have to make a choice to hope. We have to make a choice to be patient. Just like peas don't magically end up in our dishes, we have to do some work to get the health benefits of patience and hope. Practicing hope isn't a passive thing. We do not wait in the hope the way we might wait in a hospital waiting room or in a classroom as we're waiting for the dismissal bell to ring. As followers of Jesus, we practice hope with patient endurance. And it's an active waiting, one that takes part in what God is doing in the world. In the building of God's beloved community, there isn't an in the meantime. There shouldn't be a, a passive or an apathetic waiting. Building God's beloved community is active. It takes us making the choice, not just once, but over and over and over again. It's the work of fostering relationships and taking part in conversations and sharing stories with one another. It's being vulnerable and giving a piece of yourself to someone else. We're living into hope when we do that. We're not just talking about God's abundant love, but we're acting on it and we're living it. We're living into hope when we're doing the work of radical hospitality, which may not always be the most comfortable thing. Radical hospitality could look a lot like patient endurance. It could be the risk of trying something that we might not like, eating a dish that someone has prepared for us, even if we're not wild about the ingredients taking time out of our schedules to make a visit or to engage in a conversation or to help someone with a project or to serve something that might not result in a thank you or a direct benefit to ourselves. In the remembering of our baptisms, we remember that we are all part of God's family. And families have responsibilities. Families take work. In our families, sometimes we mess up and sometimes, by mistake, we hurt each other or we disappoint each other. Sometimes in families, we are not very patient. Sometimes we just can't bring ourselves to eat our peas. 
And what's beautiful is that God loves us still. God takes us whoever we are and whatever we bring to the table and loves us and cares for us and never leaves us alone. When we can't be patient, God waits with us. When we don't know how to hope or what to hope for, God helps to give us vision. The most beautiful part of God's promises is that they are made for us without condition. God chose us first and continues to choose us every single day. We will be asked to be patient and we will sometimes struggle to be. We will get frustrated with the state of the world and sometimes it will be hard to remember what God has promised. And in those hard times, we will rely on each other. We will rely on our family, on God's family, to receive and share God's abundant love and radical hospitality. We will wait and we will hope that God's Holy Spirit will give us everything we need. All of that energy and intelligence and imagination and love for the wonderful work of God's beloved community. And we might even rejoice at the idea of eating peas and practicing some patient endurance. May this be so. Amen.